In the name of Jesus, amen. If you're a fan of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, there's this tremendous scene in the third movie. Gandalf and the hobbits are fleeing from their fiery, flaming furnace, the Balrog, that's bearing down on them to destroy them. And Gandalf stands and he, he ushers the hobbits forward on this small, narrow uh, stone bridge. And as he ushers them to sh safety, he turns and he looks and he sees the Balrog bearing down at him. And he looks at him straight in the face, and he has this, this great, iconic, heroic line. You probably know it. He stands there, and he says, go back to the shadows. You shall not pass. And he stabs his staff into the stone below his feet. Here I stand. Standing there face to face, looking at his enemy, unwavering, unflinching. That's the stuff heroes are made out of. That's the stuff that legends and lore and movies are made out of as he stands there, defiant of his enemy that stands before him. That's where Luther was. As he stood before Charles V, standing there in that room full of those who would persecute him, Standing there knowing that his comments, his answer to them could very well end his life, just like John Huss about a hundred years earlier. Luther stood there composed, thinking about what he was going to say, and his words are these. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot, and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. Here I stand. I can do not otherwise. God help me. Amen. That's a bold confession. That's standing unwaveringly on the truth and the promises that God has given in his word. That's where Stephen was in the Acts reading for today. Stephen being appointed by those in the early church as the church grew, the church work grew, and they needed more to help. So Stephen is brought in and he finds himself more than likely at the first council meeting head to head with others in the church, with the council, with the elders, with those who were there who disagreed what the law and the prophets said about the coming of the Messiah. And Stephen stood firm, unwavering. He stands there with those who are like him in the church, and he says, you are a stiff-necked people. You're just like your ancestors. You kill the prophets. You even kill the Christ. That's a mic drop moment. Standing firm, unwavering, looking at those who opposed him and God's word and refusing to relent. Standing firm on what God has said. His eyes looking up to heaven after his enemies are stoning him, beginning to stone him. His faith unwavering. His compassion and trust in Christ as he prays for his enemies, forgive them as they are casting the stones that will take his life. Stephen there, in that moment when the world is bearing down on, any, any, on him and yet he looks up and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. His faith unwavering, standing firm on the promises and the truth of God's word. I'm convinced we like the heroes like Gandalf, especially the heroes of faith like Luther and Stephen. Because when we look at our lives, we don't see unwavering. We don't see that absolute steadfastness in the confession of faith that we have been given to us. Oftentimes when we look into our own lives and our own witness, it's weak. It's wavering. It's wimpy. I'm convinced that so often we hear it in confirmation. We've learned it. You know the words as we go through the Ten Commandments and then we hear what Dr. Luther wrote. We should fear, love, and trust in God so that we do not. And then it isn't long after that. With the pressure of the world, maybe the pressure of our peers, 
maybe the desires of our own sinful flesh, that in, instead of saying we should fear, love, and trust in God so that we do not, we oftentimes say, why not? When God's truth is challenged and our opponents push us, we oftentimes take sinful pride in being right and making them the enemy. Instead of recognizing that it's the evil one who brings divisions. And these that push and persecute us are the very people that Christ died on the cross and shed his blood for. When we're persecuted and ridiculed for standing firm in the one true faith given to us in our baptism, we don't so easily or so quickly do like Stephen did and pray that God would forgive us, but more importantly, that he would forgive those who persecute us. When we think about standing firm like Stephen or Luther or standing firm to the point of death, oftentimes we hear Satan and our weak flesh whisper in our ear, run away, give in. Who are you to stand here? You don't know enough. Do you think you can really say this looking back at your life? All of those things whispered in our ear by the evil one trying to get us to give up the confession of faith that Christ has given to us in our baptism. Our sin clearly shows us the times that we have not stood firm. That we've been weak, our confession has been wavering, and at times even wimpy. Our witness has not been unwavering. But fear not, dear brother and sister in Christ, neither was Luther's, neither was Stephen's. Their life was plagued by sin and doubt and fear, just like ours. But it is for them and for us that our Savior Jesus Christ stood in our place, died for us, forgave our sins, and the pronouncement to you is, you are forgiven. Jesus is not our hero. He is far greater than that. He is God, in whom we are to fear, love, and trust above all things. Jesus is our Savior, our Redeemer, our Victor, who has stood in our place, unwavering, unrelenting, against all the hordes of hell and the devils, and stood firm obedient to his Father. Jesus didn't stand powerful and bold in front of those who would take his life. He was humble. Humble even to the point of death. Death on a cross. Jesus didn't have that iconic line that heroes are made of and legend and lore and movies are made from. As he was there on the cross, fulfilling all righteousness for all mankind, for you, dear brother and sister in Christ, his words in a loud voice were simply this, to tell us die. It is finished. Your sin, all your sin, all of the things that the evil one would bring to accuse you, paid for by Christ completely on the cross, you are free and you are forgiven because Jesus stood firm, unwavering in your place. He stood firm. He gave us the gifts so that we can stand firm as well by grace, through faith, through the word that he has given to us. Believe it or not, you've had that here I stand moment. For some of you, it was not long ago as you stood up in front of the church in the white alb with the red carnation on that confirmation Sunday. For some of you, it's been a while. But as you gathered there, the pastor asked you this. Do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? And your answer was, I do, by the grace of God. Say that with me again. You confessed. Your bold confession was not based on your confidence. It wasn't based on your knowledge. It wasn't based on your good works. It was based in the confession of faith that God gifted to you in your baptism, that you were taught by the church and that you boldly confessed. The pastor continued, Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word, and deed to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit even to death? And you answered? That was about as wimpy as the first time that you gave it. Let's try again. And this confession is not your own. You confessed that you stand 
by the grace of God, by his gift to you, giving you the ability through the Holy Spirit living in you to stand firm even to the point of death. The pastor asked you again, do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession in church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? And you answered, that's a bold confession that trusts in the promises that God has given to you through faith. That's the kind of confession that, that heroes, no, that's the kind of confession that witnesses and martyrs and confessors of the truth of God's word is made from. That's the bold confession that we stand in. So here we are, 21st century. Higher things is just about over. We're going to have to go down from the mountain, literally. Back to our lives. Back to our dysfunctional and broken families. Back to our struggling relationships and our workplaces with people who persecute us. Where does that leave us? It leaves us here, where the church has always been. Where the church has, has brought you in and catechized and taught you to stand, to bow, to kneel under the cross of Christ where he has given you his gifts, where he has brought you into faith in the waters of baptism, where he watered you and he faithed you. Here we stand where the gifts that God has given to us as we have confessed that we have been weak and wimpy and wavering again and our Lord from the cross speaks to you and says, you are forgiven. Here we stand receiving the gifts that God has given to us, worded and strengthened in the confession that we might trust in him always in the joys and in the times that are not so joyful, in the times of prosperity and persecution, in the times when we face our death, knowing that our death and our life again is in the hand of God. Here we stand in just a, a few hours, bodied and bloodied by our Lord Jesus Christ as he comes to us again, given and shed for you, for the forgiveness of sin. And then at the end of the divine service, you'll be pieced as he sends you out with his peace, a peace that the world does not know. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, here we stand with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. God help us. Amen. And now may the peace that passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.